All right. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Dee. I really appreciate it. We were talking about uh, this some months ago. Uh, we looked at when we could have a discussion about Ben Davis Jr., the communist councilman from Harlem. And, uh, you know, I thought, of course, that February would be the right time since it's Black History Month. And uh, Ben Davis himself uh, helped with uh, Carter G. Woodson and helped to start Black History Month by passing as a councilman the first Black History Week, which was in New York City. And uh, so I thought it'd be fitting that we do it uh, the first week of February, but honestly, I didn't think about it being the Super Bowl. So um, I know those of you who are with us today, um, you know, uh, either really don't care about the Super Bowl or are at least uh, dedicated and, and wanting to know more about Ben Davis. Uh, that's uh, what I hope to give you out of this presentation today is uh, a little bit of an, an, um, a background and understanding, maybe share some stuff with you about Ben Davis. If you've never heard of him before, you'll know a little bit about who he is. If, you, if, you've, uh, if you're aware of Ben Davis, uh, then maybe I can uh, show you some things that you haven't seen before or maybe remind you of, of, of uh, uh, some thoughts uh, long past. I have some media to share with you, some original newspaper, some newspaper clippings, should I say, and then some ephemera, some political party campaign materials uh, that I'll share with you for the Communist Party, uh, the Labor Archive in, in, in New York. Um, I also want to get across to you a crucial thesis or understanding of Ben Davis's life and his role, uh, not only as a communist council member or as a communist party national leader, which he was, but I, I want to understand his, I want you to, I want to share a thesis with you about his representation as a black man in, in mass media and in, in, in modernity. And as a media scholar, um, this is of, of, of key importance to me. I'm a scholar of mass communication and media studies. And I, I spent my uh, dissertation, I spent my time uh, writing my dissertation about Ben Davis and the 10 years after uh, World War II. And I compared his image in black newspapers in the black press, and I compared it to some uh, white newspapers and their representation. And uh, really what I was zeroing in on was his uh, representation and portrayals before uh, and after the Smith Act, which is the, the, the key to period of time. Ben Davis was tried and actually imprisoned under the Smith Act for several years. And um, this is something that has a dramatic, dramatic um, influence on his career and his image as a leader in the black community. And so what I hope to share with you is this, this thesis, this argument, this understanding, and um, I hope to bring some thoughts about what it means to represent leftist ideologies as a black man in, 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 in modern society. Um, when I went to go look at Ben Davis and I found him as a, as a topic suitable for my dissertation. I was looking out for those images, those revolutionary images, those radical images uh, before the Black Panthers and Malcolm X before 68. And I eventually came to uh, Ben Davis. But anyway, uh, I'll share with some information about his life before the indictment um, in, in July 1948. He and 11 other National Party members uh, national uh, leaders of the Communist Party were indicted under the Smith Act. Um, and then I'll talk about his um, portrayal and the, the, the representations of him and his life uh, after the indictment. And then we'll have some discussions and we'll talk about the implications. And if you have any questions, we hope to get to at least a few of those. We'll be with each other for about the next 50 minutes or so. Um, <clears throat> here is a picture of Ben Davis and Paul Robinson. I actually, I have that picture up here. I, I you know, it, it hangs in my house. It's, it's rather important to me um, for a several different reasons. Uh, I look at the partnership between Ben Davis and Paul Robinson. And of course I see first and foremost friends, uh, Paul Robinson, who many of us know about 
uh, legendary athlete and speaker and um, theater, he did theater and he sung and he was just a, a wonderful world-class entertainer, one of the highest paid entertainers in the world. And one of his best, dearest friends was Ben Davis Jr. who, uh, when, when Paul Robinson would play Othello, he said that he would conjure the image of uh, Ben Davis betraying him uh, to feel the anger required to, to, uh, to, to act out the scene where Iago betrays Othello. Uh, ben Davis was a, a, a dear friend and these uh, gentlemen shared a lot of background uh, and similarities uh, uh, for who they were in society and, uh, you know, of course, their time period. Um, what I want to, of course, is share with you, the peculiar thing is, is you know, here in 1943, uh, a, a black man, a Harvard-educated lawyer uh, uh, who went to Morehouse and Amherst, he, he, was, he was elected a New York council member, and he was actually from Georgia. He was the son of a, a newspaper owner, a black newspaper owner, and the first uh, Republican GOP delegate. Uh, for the um, United States, uh, he, you know, very up cla uh, upper class uh, upbringing for Ben Davis. Um, and I, I want to say he was like, you know, in, in, the, in the spirit of Du Bois, it was like the talented 10th. You know, he had very much been groomed to be a leader in the black community, uh, much like uh, uh, Paul Robinson. Uh, now, Ben Davis uh, uh, goes to Harvard uh, to get trained in law, and he comes back to, to Georgia, uh, in Dawson, Georgia. And uh, he becomes involved, uh, opens up his practice, and becomes involved in 1932 in the Angelo Herndon trial. And uh, at a time when it was very uh, difficult for black lawyers, uh, uh, he decided to represent Angelo Herndon, which uh, was, of course, uh, uh, on charges for insurrection for simply having Marxist materials. And uh, when Ben Davis, um, when Ben Davis went through that trial and went through that experience, he came out of it a radicalized person who had actually joined the Communist Party. He was really taken by their interracial meetings, by the, 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 the feelings and the values and their dedication to fight for the uh, for the working class uh, uh, poor that, that, that he grew up around. Um, so let me read you a little passage. And uh, this is from the communist councilman from Harlem, his, his notes, uh, his autobiographical notes, because Ben Davis died a little too early to write his own autobiography. But um, Again, the Angela Herndon trial was a significant um, influence on him. And uh, of course, Angela Herndon was thrown in, in, in jail. He was facing death and he was given 20 some odd years in prison. Um, <clears throat> and it says, I, I grabbed his hand. We looked at each other with understanding. I assured him an immediate appeal. As for me, I entered the trial as a lawyer and ended it as his communist comrade. Um, the kind of racism that Ben Davis experienced during that time, uh, the kind of white supremacy he experienced uh, really contributed uh, to, to, to his radicalism. Um, uh, he was also not able to, after the work that he was doing, it wasn't just Angelo Herndon, it was like the Scottsboro Boys, he was uh, instrumental in putting together their defense and actually had the mothers of uh, the Scottsboro boys uh, sign, sign um, the legal de defense paperwork. Um, so after this work that he was doing in the South in the 30s, he basically gets run up out of uh, Georgia uh, by the Ku Klux Klan. And, um, you know, even dur just during this time, we see a strange confluence of, of strange dynamics of him as this rather radical person, radical defense lawyer, you know, he's getting protected by uh, priests or their pastors. He's getting um, 
protected and, and seen by the black people in the community as an important force because here it is that he's a leader, he's a champion. It didn't have to necessarily do with his radical politics or the ideology he espoused, but the fact that he was who he was uh, doing something so important. So anyway, he uh, goes to New York uh, where he feels that he would be uh, safer. Uh, and and he immediately you know starts organizing, working the party, and starts to uh, eventually uh, run for for office. But what what I want to point out here is that Ben Davis um, he really represents the inverse of the modern forces shaping America in, in post World War II life. Uh, that's definitely Gerald Horn, a scholar's big big take on it. He, he wrote a lot about Ben Davis and. He's influential in um, leftist uh, history and politics. He uh, says, hey, listen, after World War II, the major dynamics facing and shaping the, the world is, is capitalism and white supremacy. And, and Ben Davis is, uh, is about as opposite as that you could get. You know, here it is. Um, ben Davis is, is, is a black man who's a communist who's actually espousing a uh, support for a Soviet, a black Soviet state in the South. Uh, <clears throat> similar to Marcus Garvey at the time uh, in the UNIA, uh, the Communist Party decided to call for a separate black state in the South. Uh, Lenin himself in 1928 said um, that the black worker, you know, there's this question of whether or not, this is called the Negro question. It was a question of whether or not uh, what black people went through um, in, 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 the, in slavery and in the industrialized America was the industrialization of America, whether or not that was a separate and distinct form of oppression that no one else had faced up until that point in time. And this, this is called the Negro question. And, and very oddly, uh, you know, I would say oddly because this is the international workers movement, right? This is the communist party of of the modern era, and they imagine themselves not as black people or Russians or different demographics, but of course as workers. So the idea that anyone, let alone Lenin, would answer the Negro question was saying, yes, you know, black workers are, are definitely different, and they're the revolutionary force in America that have the potential to really uh, create a revolution. And so when I look at Ben Davis and his partnership, I think about the arts and the entertainment, and I think about the politics. I think about um, the the broad ecosystem of people who are impacted by this very revolutionary force in these dynamics that they might not have known, probably did not really know about. But here it is: um, you have revolutionary theory uh, spreading and action spreading throughout the world. You have an earlier Red Scare in America uh, in, the, in the 1910, 1919. Uh, and then you have a communist party that's rising up, that's gaining members, that's appealing to black people. And <clears throat> this is, uh, I, I think, a, a very, very key point in the history of Ben Davis is something for us to take out of his life and it's also something for us to think about the revolutionary power and the trajectory of uh, revolutionary thought throughout throughout America. What happens uh, to, to, to Ben Davis, I really think, is like practice for COINTELPRO, uh, the FBI, uh, the powers that be the system in America, like really test out on these early communists um, a ways of, of, of repression because they really feared uh, not just a cold war, but they, they, they really feared uh, that any, any one of these people, particularly black people, could have been an, an agent of, of a Soviet, of a foreign dictatorship. And so this thought to Americans was, was truly horrifying. And, and I believe uh, from my studying, you know, that it is, from my studies, that it is um, the, the appeal to, the appeal that communism and socialist thought has for black people inherently is uh, one of the things that makes it so dangerous and makes it so that we need to have a cold war. It also shapes the dynamics, the repression, anti-leftism, 
the, the oppression that Ben Davis faced and others faced also explains why the civil rights movement panned out the way it did and why Martin Luther King as a social and a moral leader was able to rise up as opposed to a, a Ben Davis or, or some other political actor. Um, I've shown my students this picture and other pictures of Ben Davis and I say, oh, do you know who this is? And they tell me, oh, is it Martin Luther King? Um, and I just think that that's fascinating uh, uh, for more than one reason, but it's my understanding that Martin Luther King was not on the radar of the FBI uh, until he actually met Ben Davis. Ben Davis rushed to the hospital to give uh, Martin Luther King blood when he was stabbed when he was in New York one time. But uh, it's my understanding. It's been a long time since I've dove through some of this history. But the point being is um, that uh, of a leader that, that Ben Davis is, um, uh, is a specific archetype. This male uh, 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 Harvard educated person with all the attributes, you know, of, of, of a Renaissance man who played tennis and violin, but um, also was really down with the people and can do lawyering. Um, <clears throat> Let me see here. I want to now talk a little bit for you uh, about the, the, the time period that we're talking about. Because I look a lot at black newspapers portrayals of Ben Davis and um, you know, the black press at the time was a very special institution. Um, as black papers had been, newspapers had been for some time um, cultivating in, in, in their own space, um, really uh, it, uh, talking about black issues, uh, focusing on the community in, in a very special way that um, I actually meant, lament is not, 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 not here. Now, during World War II, uh, um, at the time that Ben Davis is, is, is coming to his own, uh, the newspapers like Ben Davis, like America, uh, the black newspapers were a very, this very strange situation, which is why Ben Davis is even able to get elected. Um, during, bef before World War II, you know, the black newspapers had been very critical of America and, and racism and, and of course, different issues that you would expect a black press uh, to be concerned about. Um, but uh, in the World War, World War II posed quite a, a challenge, of course, because of the fact they were forced to essentially be patriotic, patri patriotic, like it would have been seen as treasonous to not support the war effort. Um, they also were living with this what's called double V dynamic, this double victory uh, dynamic that somehow if the war effort was supported, then black people could fight racism abroad. And, and gain a victory abroad, and that would necessarily bring a victory uh, at home for Black people because uh, they were fighting this, this, this racism. So um, Ben Davis, who also, you know, of course, during World War II, Russia and America are, are on the same side of things to, uh, after a certain point in time to, um, you know, defeat Hitler. And this makeshift alliance also allowed special kind of uh, opening for Ben Davis uh, to take in history. So in the 1940s, 1943, and, you know, um, to the mid 40s, communism wasn't like illegal, and it wasn't criminalized quite yet. But this is what's going to happen to Davis. It wasn't exactly celebrated. It wasn't like it was everywhere, but it wasn't like tolerated. It wasn't seen as you know, uh, something that would uh, get you arrested and get you thrown in prison like we see happen to, to, to Ben Davis uh, sometime after. Um, <clears throat> this is also where my interest as a media scholar comes in. Of course, the period of time before that Ben Davis is indicted and the kind of representations that the black newspapers were willing to, for, willing to, 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 to give of, of Ben Davis um, again, happens because of these strange dynamics uh, that in just a few years because of the Cold War would not happen for a long time again. And I think that it severely impacted um, 
the nature, the, the image of radicals uh, thereafter. All right. Um, but what I do in my, my media study stuff is I talk about this framing. Uh, I look at how Ben Davis is framed. And uh, framing is kind of like a complex media theory, but to give you the short of it, uh, it's rather simple at the same time. It's just like the picture that we're looking at right now. I can choose what to put in this picture by, by framing it, by cropping it, by adding things, by taking things away. I can help make meaning of the way that I present stories and people and things through the media by um, framing it a certain way. By, by, by um, if you imagine building a house, if I, if I build out a house a certain way, it's gonna take a certain shape in very much the same way with the media representation of somebody like Ben Davis, um, we can see um, representations of him uh, like we do before the indictment as being a fighter and a leader and an insider that helped to, to, to fight for black people to the inverse of that frame a lot later after his indictment where he's a fighter still, but he's, he's fighting for a, a, a foreign dictatorship and he's like an outsider and he's like a proxy. Right, like somebody who's fighting someone else's war. So it's like the same sh material is all of there. It's like the same stories, the same thrust of, of the media, but the way it's shaped has drastic impacts on, on the viewer and ultimately on history. And this is what I tried to bring forth in my work is that um, the framing of Ben Davis, and I mean that in a literal sense, and I mean that in the sense that, you know, he was framed, uh, he was, he was, <laughs> you know, um, unfairly uh, prosecuted uh, really for having quite just normal liberal democratic politics in a capitalist society. He wasn't really calling for violent um, revolution or anything. But anyway, let's press forward a little bit. I told you that I would share some media with you. So let me uh, get to sharing some media with you and, and show you a little bit more about Ben Davis in this time period. Here's just a, a, a program here for the state, New York State Communist Party. A lot of the images and stuff that I'm going to show you come from the, uh, the, the, the Labor Union Library in New York and NYU, and then some of it will come from databases where I've collected newspapers, uh, clippings. Uh, you know, here we see uh, something that's very, I wanted to start with this image because here you see a very American image. And, and we see Communist Party down at, at, at the bottom. Not an idle man, not an idle machine, not an idle acre. Here's this productivist ethos. Um, it's very interesting for the time period. But um, the thing about the Communist Party in America that I also kind of noticed as like a cultural studies analyst is, is, is that it's a very American form of communism. It's, it's, it tries to be at point, it's very independent. Uh, but here it is, we see it in their programs. Here it is, we see it in their, in their memorabilia. This is uh, some election material and some post-election material with Ben Davis. Um, <clears throat> on, the, on the left here with the arrows, we see fight with Ben Davis and arrows pointing. It says for 201. Now this is significant. Um, if you notice on the right-hand side of the screen here, we also have um, the type. It's, it's, it's shaped the way the, way the uh, description of Ben Davis and um, Bob Thompson are up there. It's shaped in an arrow. And this is a very uh, clever way to point towards the actual voting mechanism, how you would have voted um, in what was called pro proportional representation system that they had in New York, which also explains how Ben Davis was able to get elected. Uh, the proportional representation system, which doesn't exist anymore, is a special form of voting where um, you know you could vote for really radical people and if your first vote wasn't chosen then they would move down to your second vote and so there was these arrows to indicate your first second third fourth uh, choices and if the the say for example if ben davis you voted for ben davis and 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 he didn't get enough votes to win uh, then they simply looked at your second uh, the second person that you voted for. That's a lot different than a winner-take-all system, and it allows for a, a lot more radical politics uh, to come out because people aren't afraid that they're just throwing their vote away uh, for somebody who might not uh, uh, actually win. 
Uh, so this proportional representation system was, was really important because Ben Davis, although from Harlem, was able to represent at large. He actually took over Adam Clayton Powell's seat who decided to run for state government. And it was a rocky road for Ben Davis to actually get elected after the other failed uh, campaigns that he had. Um, Adam Clayton Powell, for example, uh, didn't uh, support him outright at first, but there was this fear that if Adam Clayton Powell goes up to the state legislator that they might lose black representation in um, the council. And so that put a little bit of pressure on, on leaders in the black community to support Ben Davis. Uh, ben Davis was the second co co communist uh, council member elected his his um, comrade Peter Caccioni is I think how you say his name was um, <clears throat> also elected uh, and the, the the camaraderie that they had the solidarity between the Jewish and the black community at the time it also speaks to Ben Davis's ability to get elected there was a Jewish candidate who actually stepped out of the race uh, and supported Ben Davis. And this was all really like Im important step for folks. There's campaign materials uh, for, for, for Ben Davis and Peter and um, Hebrew. It's uh, very, very, very just interesting stuff to look at if you're able to go to the, to the, to the archives and take a look at uh, some, of the, some of the things that they have there. Ben Davis was able to get elected for a variety of reasons. There's this proportional representation system. There's um, the fact that there is a need and desire for a black leader regardless of, of politics. And then there's this also understanding that uh, Ben Davis is a leader and that folks are electing a leader more than they are electing a specific party. But the proportional representation system, even for Democrats, I would say, right, you know, or main, main party people, it allowed them to separate themselves from the party machine. That's a plus for Ben Davis, but as he seems, to, as he believes later on in his life, that was also very detrimental because he didn't spend his time building up the type of political party um, and that was necessary to sustain what he and, and Peter were doing in, in the council. Um, one of the interesting things to take from Ben Davis's life, as we'll see, is that he lives his life, he believes during this interesting time of what's called Browderism, that he is living the best way he can as a communist under capitalist rule. And the kind of things that he's fighting for, uh, he believes, at, at least for this point in time, that mm, he was doing it the best way that he could. It's like, wow, uh, during the war, the communist and the capitalist literally had a seat at the table together, that that's what they were supposed to do back home. And this is part of the explanation for the strategy and for how he operated, the strategy of getting elected in the first place and for how he operated uh, as his time as a council member. Let's take a little look at some more material. Uh, so again, you know, you see the arrows pointing to uh, Robert. This is Robert Thompson, who's a candidate for comptroller. And then you see this is Ben Davis uh, running a lot of statewide stuff. Like it was like a thing that they were doing. It was like a tactical strategy to try to get elected at different points of government to try to fight and stand up against the governor and racism that uh, was institutional. But I want to draw your attention to this particular flyer uh, on the right that says, why should, why should we vets vote communist, Bob? And I, I really think it, it speaks to the kind of politics uh, of, of the day. Here it is. Mm, they are attacking Governor Dewey uh, uh, and attacking the system because they're spending hundreds of millions of dollars on what they call a swank highway. <laughs> but yet they don't have enough money to build uh, uh, but 6,000 homes for veterans. Um, and you know, it's this real line of attack. It's just interesting, the folks that they were cobbling together, this wartime ethos was definitely, this, the, the, the war, the people returning, returning home from war were front and center. There was parades during um, the, uh, the time period where uh, the Communist Party would have thousands of people, 
only 75,000 people or so in the Communist Party at the height of his membership, but they would garner, um, you know, parades of, of, of thousands and uh, veterans would be uh, right at the front of it. And um, there was just some, there's just something so special in their line, the line of attack and, and line of argument against uh, 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 Governor Dewey. It's like, you know, these vets can't even use these luxury highways, as they say. A very interesting politics, because I'm thinking about right now, if uh, we were talking about even $200 million worth of government infrastructure spending, let alone in 1940s, um, you know, labor unions, left folks, they'd be like rather happy about it. And we wouldn't be talking about uh, uh, swanky highways. We'd be talking about uh, work uh, for, our, for our folks. So anyway, this is just a very, very interesting dynamics that they have going on here. Uh, they wanted the support of veterans. Uh, I just they think also this is something in the movement. As a, uh, I'm a social justice organizer in Oakland, I work with young black men. Uh, with heal, I have healing circles, and I teach them to do social justice organizing. And you know, um, I talk often about how black men are pushed out of this movement, even in the most social justice radical spaces. Uh, the images of young black men uh, today have had a significant impact. But I think that also for veterans, right? You know, veterans aren't appreciated in the movement like uh, they, they should be, but um, it was really apparent while, uh, their, their role, their place in, <clears throat> in post-World War II society and in the movement. Uh, here it is, as I was telling you, veterans in uniform, red, uh, a head red unit in May Day Parade. 3,500 others follow. Uh, police estimate 21,000. You know, uh, there was thousands of people that showed solidarity and and heard the 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 the, the cries of of um, you know the Communist Party. I, I don't think at the time that the, the Communist Party was really as radical as they could have been. It wasn't like uh, some of um, more 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 practical or really socialist oriented policies. You know, these are really reformist uh, small steps that, that that they're trying to take. Let me show you a little bit of that uh, as we press forward here. Um, here is a message from uh, uh, your councilman, Ben Davis, Benjamin J. Davis. This is actually a pamphlet that opens up on the left. But I just, you know, I want to point out there that you see it like it doesn't say Communist Party on there, right? You know, it's like Ben Davis is being seen as a person who's Ben Davis. <laughs> He's being seen as the councilman. He's being seen as a leader, and it's kind of like separate. And I, I don't think that this this isn't because of the pressures of Cold War yet. It was just the way that he was he was promoting himself. It was a both and type of thing. Um, on the right hand um, side here, uh, this is something very special. <laughs> There's W. Uh, e. B. Du Bois uh, with a letter supporting Ben Davis in in July, 1949. That's actually after the indictment. But I just I thought I would just include it here. You know, a statement to the people of Harlem, the natural supporters of Ben Davis. Um, and so there's really something really, I hear this about Harlem still, right? You know, there's, there's something special um, about the nature of communism and, and the ideology, something special in, 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 in the hearts of black people that it appeals to. And that's what uh, this letter is, is, is talking about from Du Bois. Anyway, uh, here is a, a, a New York Times march. 1947 article, this article's pages and pages long that deals uh, with the Communist Party and, and it reflects America's growing interest in communism. But here, the leaders of the party sit at the table and just a couple of years later, these same folks will be uh, living in, in, in really different context and in, in a different reality. Um, and again, here it is, you know, they're, they're, they're smiling there. It's Eugene Dennis there at the, at the forefront. This is like very like, it's almost like normal is, is what I want to say. There's none, there's none of the Red Scare stuff here yet quite, right? Um, ben Davis spent his time as an advocate, you know, for black people and for working class people during his time in, in, in the council. 
he argued for uh, against uh, uh, racial disparities and inequities, uh, like in housing, when he pushed the metropolitan life insurance companies. I have to think about this, but I think Donald Trump's father was, I think that that's the metropolitan life company that he worked for. If somebody knows that, that would be great, but I just, that would be a fascinating connection. Either way it goes, Ben Davis fought these folks. He, he wanted to bring, he wanted to get uh, black people elected to, to various positions in the city government. Um, he was participating in society as like an emissary of the black community at, at, at other functions, whether it was dealing with major folks like Walter White at the NAACP or in these other arenas. Ben Davis was seen as like a real cool cat who was like um, really representing black, black, black people in, in lots of different spaces. He was known to be with Nino, uh, Lena Horne or Hazel Scott and Adam Clayton Powell, Kenneth Lee, all these different people were associated with him at different periods of time for some reason or another. And he was seen as just like this very, just very interesting um, image, very interesting character. But he would charge folks. He was, he was really on the police about police brutality. Like, you know, that was something that he was really fighting. Um, you know, he, he, he would protest when certain folks were beat or, or, you know, certain misconduct with police happened. Here we see him asking for a Negro uh, on the school board, a black person to be on the school board. It was like the kind of thing that he was he was doing, uh, very very typical of the way that he operated. Excuse me, as a councilman. Okay, so we come to the period of time where everything is going to change, right? Got about 18, 20 minutes here, so I'll go ahead and kind of land the plane and like, let you ask questions. But we get to the point in time where things start to get really difficult and, and change for Ben Davis, right? Because he gets him indicted um, under the Smith Acts. 1940 Smith Acts or the Alien Registration Acts made it illegal to be a part of a, a, a party, political party that advocated the overthrow of the government. It didn't have to be violent. They didn't have to take any actions. It was anything like that. And they had to essentially like register um, ben Davis and his comrades did not, and they were indicted. Um, and this is, like I said, this is when all the newspaper coverage, I looked at hundreds and hundreds of newspaper articles over these 10 years from these different newspapers, and um, there's a bulk of the, his, the newspaper articles that mention Ben Davis happened in, in 1949 and 1959 around his indictment and his trial, which is billed as at their trial, these 11 Communist Party uh, leaders. Uh, the, the 12th was um, bed, bed, bedridden, but this was like the trial of the century as it was billed. Um, uh, and it really is like a travesty of justice. Like, you know, these folks were really mis mistreated and uh, the ramifications uh, I think have had an impact on our, on our movement for years and years and years. Uh, so, so here we see by the time 1948 comes and the indictments come in July, we start to see Ben, ben Davis's name get associated with bail and, and, and folks remaining at large because they're out on the run and these folks are indicted and there's this trial and this investigation. All, all of these things are coming and that's what gets reported on in the news. Um, here we see the, 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 the trial getting set, all the leaders up there, and this is like a zoo of a trial, a zoo of a trial. There's 400 police officers stationed at the at the courthouse in uh, New York. And they, of course, the Communist Party and the, and the, the community protested the excessive use of, of, of force. But it was a demonstration of power. It was to make a point about uh, communism and, and this leadership. It was to make a hard, um, hard cut to the right and to McCarthyism and the Red Scare. Davis was ousted. As, as council member, um, his, his, his comrade, uh, a laborite, was quit in, 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 in protest. You know, it was just very, you know, he wasn't in, he was just indicted. You know, he wasn't, wasn't convicted and, and, and you know, his seat was taken from him, of course, and he loses reelection afterwards. But this trial really impacted um, Ben Davis his, his career never really made it back the same. I think it impacted New York. 
It impacted uh, leftist politics. It was a zoo of the trial. Um, it had been made aware that there had been informants in the Communist Party for years and years and years. There's a story about a young lady who was a photographer who spent seven some odd years in, in undercover in the Communist Party. And, um, you know, you just really see the, the persecution um, that takes place with the, 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 this whole trial. Here is um, some campaign material. Um, and if you look at that ticket there, that's, that's just a real interesting ticket there. New York State Election Campaign Committee, Communist Party. And uh, there's Ben Davis, Ishmael Adder, Ab Abner, Ab Amter, um, Elizabeth Gurney Flynn. And this is actually used as evidence here uh, in, their, in, their, in their trial. It's, it's, it's got a stamp on it. It's got a, a note on it. Um, or it's used to, to, to prove their, their, their Communist Party ties. <clears throat> Um, one, $1 million bail was asked for in 1949 of these 11 Reds, these 11 Communist Party leaders. This is a tremendous amount of money to, to, to ask for, I think, even in today's money. But it speaks to the statement that was being made. Um, after these party members were successfully tried and convicted, uh, there were many, many, many more uh, Communist Party folks rounded up. And, uh, tried and convicted of Smith Act violations. After Ben Davis was released at one point in time, um, there was a celebration, uh, he was out on bail, and violence broke out. And it was really just, this is a really interesting thing, it's worth, you know, uh, like reading an article or, or a book about or something, or writing one about, but, you know, there was real suspicion that that violence was was not came from outside the community like it was probably some outside operator but the, the, the catholic priests and the folks in the community really to testify to that and, you know really vouched for uh, ben davis and uh, what happened uh, when he was released anyway this is very interesting uh, very interesting uh, facts of history um uh, before I let you ask some questions, before I open it up for questions, uh, I think the thing to say is after Ben Davis goes to prison in 1951, after his appeals run out, he spends approximately uh, almost four years of his five-year sentence in the federal penitentiary in Indiana, and it was super segregated. And, and even there, he was able to successfully sue to get the uh, prison integrated, the federal prison integrated. Um, and so he was trying to do any and everything he can uh, to, 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 to fight for working class people. But when he came back from prison, of course, his image was destroyed and it was kind of like difficult to, 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 to be uh, a communist. People who were associated with Ben Davis were even getting uh, 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 persecuted. I say that there's a black blacklist of, of folks like Hazel Scott and Canada Lee and um, just a whole bunch of different folks that were involved with uh, Ben Davis that participated in fundraisers or, or went to parties or something like that for Ben Davis that were later uh, accused of being communist in, in, in various forms or, or fashions. Um, when Ben Davis gets out, there was a couple of hundred people at his, his release. And that's, you know, pretty nice. I'm thinking about organizing a, a, a uh, uh, an event where a couple hundred people came, but uh, compare that to the thousands, to the, to the 21 some odd thousand people that were coming in, in, in the uh, uh, May Day parade that they were having before. It's like a stark, stark contrast when he gets out. Now, he spends a lot of his time after uh, and leading up to his death in 1964, really bogged down in party politics. His health starts to fail, and he was just like a person that had been uh, really run, 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 run ragged, you know, um, it's really unfortunate. And had he been in a different space, our whole history might 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 be different. Had he had different support, had he been able to, uh, you know, support Che Guevara and 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 <clears throat> uh, you know Fidel and all of these other world events, you know, we might really be in a different space here in America. But um, you know, some of that's popping up on my mind before I open it up for questions. Is you know this image of Fidel Castro or Che Guevara, you know, in Harlem. This, this communism and 
there's a reason for it all, right? You know, there's 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 a reason before the Black Panthers, before um, you know Angela Davis, before Malcolm X. You know, there was Ben Davis. There was this radical uh, communist council member, but he was um, you know also a very genteel upper class person, and and that was one of the things that really scared folks. But let me leave you here with this quote, um, and you know this is after some time, you know, he tries to, to, to get reelected to different parts of government, but he comes back to Harvard, you know, where he speaks to, 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 to his uh, college, you know, he speaks to students of college there and he says, it may be of interest of you as students here to know how uh, one of you who has so substantially similar educational experiences to your own became a communist. I grew up in a typical Negro Republican home in the deep south. Um, but then he goes on to say, uh, first credit for recruiting me goes not to communist, but to the savage white supremacy assaults of, of the trial judge Lee B. Watt against all Negroes. Only secondarily does the credit go to the Communist Party, which provided an, a, a rational, effective, and principled path of activity and struggle through which the hideous Jim Crow system uh, uh, could be abolished forever in the United States. Um, so, you know, Ben Davis was a Jim Crow warrior. He was some folk. He was he was out here fighting uh, for civil rights of black people uh, uh, before that particular strategy came into focus. Um, you know, he just lived at a very odd particular time. Like I said, his dad was a GOP delegate, and um, you know, a, an old man told him, old black man told him, he said, "Well, your daddy was a Lincoln Republican, so you must be a Lincoln communist, and I'll go ahead and 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 trust you and go along with you." You know. Um, it's very, very strange times, you know, uh, A. Philip Randolph uh, was, was quoted for saying, you know, well, why would you put the, the, the onus, why would you put the barrier of being uh, a both uh, red and, and, and black, you know. Um, what Ben Davis, did, the life that he did live was an exemplary life, and I think that he made some of the best choices that he could given the, the circumstances and the dynamics and the time period that he lived. All right, thank you. And let me add, open it up for questions for you. Okay, everybody. Uh, thank you, uh, Prince. Uh, it, your presentation was truly fascinating. Uh, the floor is now open for uh, questions and comments. If you'd like to uh, raise a question or comment, please use your raised hand icon to indicate, please, uh, click the picture of the hand to indicate that you want to speak and your mic will be opened. I will not be able to read written questions. Uh, so if you have a question, please use your raised hand icon to indicate, please you click the picture of the hand to indicate that you uh, would like to speak uh, either to introduce a question or uh, make a comment. Okay. Hello, Denny, your mic is open. Hi, D. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, good. Uh, Dr. Dr. White, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I do have a question. I have a quick comment um, for especially party members that may not be aware. Um, I'm reading a book about the um, early days of the Communist Party here in Hawaii. And according to the author of this book, the Smith Act was actually um, written and passed, particularly to get Harry Bridges out of the country. Um, the Congress, both parties have been, or anti-labor facets of both parties have been trying very hard in different ways and failing to get Harry Bridges, who became leader of the ILWU, um, to get him out of the country. And the Smith Act was passed particularly and especially for him. So that's just a bit of trivia that we may not know about and I'm sharing. The question I have is, um, you talked about um, Ben Davis's entry into the party. Um, and I know from other readings that a lot of black people were drawn to the Communist Party. What from your reading, can you unpack a little bit what particularly drew him to the party? And in answering that question, because um, we've been doing a lot of party building here um, in the last year or so and ongoing, what 
can the party do to repeat that today to draw more black people into our party? Thank you. Uh, thank you. That's a very, very great question and a wonderful comment. And um, it did it highlight something that I, I definitely wanted to say about the nature of Ben Davis's life, what happened to these folks and, and what happened um, with this Hawaii party and the origins of the Smith Act. This is a clear example of where folks are using international relations and dynamics to mess around with local party politics. Right, you know, and to and to deal with local politics. So I think that this is something that we see throughout our time. Uh, we think about our Muslim brothers and sisters who have been persecuted over the last 20 years here in America. And it's like there is a very like there's an excuse to use international politics to come down on local folks. And I think that's what happened there. And I think that that's what happened to Ben Davis in, in more than one way. And Paul Robinson, like they were trying to deal with these folks who because they were losing grasp and they brought in, uh, 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 um, you know, the dynamics of xenophobia and, and racism on a, on a global level. Um, so the other thing is, though, is uh, to answer your questions, how might we, um, uh, what did Ben Davis face that, that brings him to, to want to, uh, you know, take up, take up the party, the call of the party? You know, uh, I think he saw firsthand true injustice and, and depravity of white supremacy. Uh, he stood and walked with somebody side by side in their time of need. And he was able to empathize with this young person who he must have felt the spirit with. There's something about young people where, you know, we, we, we feel them uh, leading, leading us um, um, towards where we need to go. But I think it was simply his exposure to, to communist to, to party meetings and to communist party materials. When he read as a lawyer, he had to look at the evidence against his client. He, uh, he, he, he got radicalized. I mean, it, it seemed like the solution that he was looking for. Okay, uh, I'm looking for uh, other raised hands. If you have a comment or you have a question, please use, please click the uh, raised hand uh, picture and we can open your mic. Okay, someone wrote a question. How receptive is the black press today to open communist party writers? publishing news articles uh, slash editorials? Well, my first question is what black press? You know what I'm saying? Like the black press as an institution has really crumbled um, for more and more than, more than one reason. But if we look at just the, the Brown versus Board of Education, uh, lots of black institutions um, faced real uh, peril uh, uh, since, since um, you know, integration really, you know what I mean? So I, I don't think that um, there's a quality uh, there, but uh, most most media today, and for my assessment, you know, the Facebook pages, the like the root, that's kind of pops up to me as being an interesting black, black media space. These are still very capitalist, corporate owned media spaces that are, that, that, that are very bourgeois, very, very middle class uh, or very capitalist should I say so I, I wouldn't expect them to, to be uh, very receptive to, to open uh, communist discussion but I think what folks the, the history of communism is something that's just more people are interested in and there's parts of life that keep on coming out about it that I think make it newsworthy but I think that the spirit the value the attitudes the beliefs the instincts the analysis of communism is something that black folks need in any space. So, so if, if you're able to bring that to those spaces, then I say do. Uh, 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 I'm not necessarily saying disguise it, but um, I am, do what's effective. There was another question. Uh, the documents that you shared, written question, the documents that you shared, are they available at the, uh, is it Tenement? library it is they are available Tenement. there they were that was actually it's been about five years now since i collected those specific images you know um so i can only imagine more is available all right the last go round looking for additional questions looking for hands 
Are there any other questions or comments? And I'm not seeing any. Uh, yes, I do see one. Alex, your mic is open. Alex Giovanoni, your mic is open. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Dee. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. White. Um, it's been a really wonderful presentation, very informative. I've I've learned a lot, and I honestly feel like I don't really know enough to ask a really good question. But I, I do have a, a quick question um, related to, I guess, comparing uh, Ben Davis to uh, uh, W.E.B. Du, du Bois, or Du Bois, um, right, the NAACP founder. I know he joined the Communist Party USA, and um, and I remember that um, he made a pretty, um, he made an open statement about um, sort of the situation in the Soviet Union and the situation in the conflict between uh, Stalin and Trotsky. And he kind of endorsed this, the Soviet government and that the Stalinist position. And I always thought that was very interesting. And, um, and I was wondering like if Ben Davis, um, you know, he was a local politician, uh, local uh, city councilman, but I wonder if he made like, um, if he like, publicly talked much about like the Soviet Union or or gave these sort of Marxist analysis analyses looking at sort of international affairs and uh, maybe a few words about that would be interesting. But yeah, thank you. This has been great. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, he definitely, you know, there, there, there's there's also something with the black press and there's there's something about the appeal of communism for, for, for black people in, in, in the 40s and the 50s. Uh, that deals with their arising, uh, awakening of international politics, like during the, um, the Italian-Ethiopian War that really sparked people, you know what I mean? That really made people want to uh, know about Africa uh, uh, and uh, what, was, what was going on. So I, I think that there's a, little, there's a little bit of appeal that's naturally there. Uh, and then, you know, Ben Davis did support Stalin. It was a very, uh, uh, you know, he, he was a very party man. And um, I think that he did make those connections. It was a, a relevant issue. And, and like I said, in the, especially the depictions of him uh, in, the, in the media, it was like a central point. Uh, he was seen as a proxy. He was seen as like a person who was like the hand of Moscow was the, the, the phrase that was often associated with both the Communist Party and Ben Davis specifically. Like uh, they saw them, as, uh, the, the, the FBI saw them and the media would portray them. Their, their detractors and critics, uh, uh, um, which there was, there was many, uh, there was some really uh, uh, critical black people of, of, of the Communist Party and of Ben Davis specifically. Um, yeah, they used it to attack him. And um, anyway, very, very interesting uh, uh, period of time. Um, and it's something that I think most uh, folks uh, should, uh, more folks should, should 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 spend some time thinking about, but um, I guess the last thing to really say about really any and all of this is is simply that more of us should know about Ben Davis, but we don't, and there's a reason, and it's this red scare, and it's this mo modern media stuff. But you know, we should know who Ben Davis is. We should know who a lot more of these people are, uh, but their lives and legacies uh, uh, were really crushed in in the weight of of, of modernity. And, and international politics that none of them really could have completely grasped at the time or foreseen. Let's take one more question. Uh, Norma, your mic is open. Norma, your mic is Hi. open. Hi. Hi. Thanks for these presentations, for this presentation. Um, talking about somebody as a young lady, uh, if you did this for all uh, comment people who, that you're talking about oh that's an old man oh that's a young man oh that's uh, an old woman and so forth uh, that'll be one thing ladies are the people that curtsy they are not um, a, a strong person like a woman or person and I think we have to uh, be careful of our language it's, it's, it is a diminishing term to talk about a young lady I, I suppose you know that the person is maybe 26 years old and that's kind of young, but that is irrelevant to the material that is being that that the person is submitting. Well, young 
I'm sorry. Relevant, what's relevant is the content. And I hope people take that into consideration. And we are not ladies. We are people. We are, if you need to identify gender, and usually that's not a, a strong thing unless you're uh, considering uh, intercourse of a different nature. But anyway, people a person, so forth. And I hope that's taken uh, seriously. I also wanted to mention, you know, communism advocates for jobs and education and schooling. And that is indoctrination into the capitalist system because they're not challenging the way that we run the world, the way that we are run by a, a profiting world. Mm -hmm. So I hope that that comes up as part of every discussion that we have to eliminate the idea that what we want is to be slaves to a, an eight hour day, 40 hour week, uh, going through school that we all end up hating actually, uh, the whole uh, construct that brings us into our subservience, our enslavement. Thank you, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you very much for your comment and question, your comment. Well, uh, Dr. Prince White, uh, on behalf of everyone, uh, thank you so much for tonight. Uh, it was truly riveting. Um, thank thank you. you for the time you put into uh, developing the presentation as you did.